Okay, so let's get started. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, the second day of open discussions we have for the OpenStack Vanilla PTG. And uh, today we have a couple of topics to cover, uh, a couple of things we have added to the agenda, and also we will have an operator hour right after uh, the topics, the open talks we have. So if you're interested about uh, listening or getting uh, or providing some feedback if you're an operator or someone using Manila, uh, please join that session or please check it out uh, on the recordings after uh, if you are watching this video. So, or, or just reach us out if you, in case you want to, to, uh, to request an enhancement or request some help or suggest something. Uh, all right, so for today, uh, the first topic, we have the scalable NFS Ganesha for CFS, the state of the kitchen. So uh, it's a couple of uh, items under this topic. So I'm handing this over to uh, Gotham and Francesco. And there's a bit of uh, on my side on this too. So yeah, uh, Gotham, would you like to get started? Yes, I can get us started. Uh, thanks, Carlos. All right, um, Victoria is not here today. Uh, she, she has some somewhere else to be. Um, so yes, th this is like a multi-headed uh, uh, initiative and uh, that's been happening over multiple releases. So I think what, what we were planning to do today is just give you a uh, summary of what happened in the uh, antelope cycle and what will happen in the bobcat cycle. Uh, for OpenStack at least, and what's happening outside of uh, OpenStack in terms of uh, updates that uh, NFS, CFFS, NFS consumers can look forward to. Uh, so let's get started, I think. Um, thanks for pulling up the Etherpad. The, uh, I, I mean, easy things first, we had like a regression on, on the Ceph side, uh, uh, which kind of hit uh, any, it's, you know, large scale uh, Ceph installation uh, pretty hard, which was the um, ensure shares bug. So as you are aware, uh, every time Manila restarts, the Manila share process, share manager process restarts, it tries to ensure driver resources. And uh, part of the reasoning there is that it, it, it wants to reconcile any changes that might've happened on the backends when the share, service, share manager service is down. Um, and so, uh, as part of this logic, we were using the idempotent um, creation of uh, of CFFS datasets, and the, this idempotent cre creation had a supposed bug fix that actually um, impacted us um, because there were some. Of, I mean, the the idempotent creation kept. Uh, I mean insisting on ensuring the mode of the data set and it's possible that this mode had changed between the time that the um, share was created and that and the share was actually used and this was this uh, was just manipulating the uh, uh, it was ending up manipulating the data set and making it uh, you know possibly unusable by the workloads and so the way we worked around this or rather fix this bug, and you can actually get this bug fix even in older releases all the way up to stable Wallaby, I think, um, is we we are preventing item potent uh, creation if the share, is, uh, a share exists. Uh, it wasn't giving us too much of a, um, uh, you know, I mean, mileage to get item potent creation to happen on every single share. So what we're doing right now is I, uh, we're just grabbing, uh, I mean, grabbing for the share on the on the back end, grabbing its export paths, and and you know if it exists, we're we're just skipping the whole uh, ensuring aspect of it for this native CFFS driver, um, and this is in theme with uh, as something else that's coming in this cycle as well, and that is the uh, scalable RFS part. Um, so if you're using native CFFS, this should have given you at least a performance improvement on top of, uh, I mean, when the share manager service restarts. Um, and right now we're, we're uh, with some more changes, we might we might actually get a little more uh, and do something meaningful with the whole ensure shares logic in the CFFS drivers. Um, so yeah, so that's the next part of the update, uh, scalable NFS Ganesha. 
uh, and you may be aware that, uh, and we've spoken about this in the past PTGs as well. Uh, so if you're using CFFS via the NFS uh, protocol today, uh, you might be uh, se setting up NFS Ganesha on your own or through any of these um, inst installers, uh, you know, that come alongside installing OpenStack, right? And that could be Triple O, it could be uh, Cola, it could be OpenStack Ansible and, and Juju Charms, whatever. Um, so there's there's a whole lot of different ways that you could install and configure uh, NFS Ganesha to work with your Manila FFS driver. Um, and the it, but so far all of those installations have only been uh, an active passive uh, NFS Ganesha instance. Um, so it is um, while while it provides uh, high availability, it is not an entirely scalable. Um, uh, because of its active passive uh, setup. And so we, uh, we began like a couple of cycles ago investigating um, uh, this new uh, feature in Ceph where uh, the Ceph cluster, uh, had, and, I mean, could now be set up with a, a NFS Ganesha cluster. And this was a cluster of uh, an, uh, HA pairs, which basically means, uh, so you could have, uh, you know, more than one uh, NFS Ganesha service, and they would be uh, in an active, active uh, configuration. Um, and so this this would, uh, in theory, provide you better uh, scalability, especially in, in a perspective like OpenStack, where you might have multiple tenants consuming um, the, the same NFS server. Um, so yeah, so... Uh, much of that work for us was done in the Z cycle, uh, where we had a new way to communicate with the NFS clusters uh, that you could set up now with Ceph Adam, um, and and that that was integrated in the in the in the driver uh, as an alternate um, way to uh, you know for the for the driver to set up and uh, tear down exports, and uh, so it won't get kicked in unless you specify an NFS cluster ID. And if you specify an NFS cluster ID, we assume that you are using an NFS cluster that was set up with Ceph Adam. Uh, and, and so that takes care of many of the things that the uh, Ganesha driver in Manila used to do. Um, now we are just using NFS manager APIs to create their own uh, update exports um, as opposed to you know, doing that via DBus. Um, what, what we used to do with the NFS, what we are still doing with the NFS Ganesha driver um, that most people are currently using. Um, but this wasn't ready for prime time yet uh, because there were some uh, issues when we were testing this. Uh, one of the biggest, uh, bigger issues was the aspect that uh, um, Ceph, uh, when setting up an active active NFS Ganesha pair, uh, uh, in order to provide a single uh, export path for uh, for users to end up using uh, has a service called the Ceph Ingress service, uh, which is a combination of HA proxy and keep alive D. Uh, and this and Ceph Ingress um, it used to actually terminate the connections and and have uh, a, a way to forward your requests to uh, the NFS Ganesha uh, server. And so if you were to try to use Manila's access rules, so you'd, you'd have the client IP from the um, from the VM or, or the container that you're trying to mount the share in, and you try to provide access to that specific IP. Uh, and, and NFS Ganesha was not seeing this IP. Uh, so client restrictions or access rules would not work uh, at all. So that's the, um, that, that was the limitation. And since this wouldn't provide you know, complete backwards compatibility with stuff. Uh, we we've just not you know uh, said that this driver is ready uh, yet, uh, and so there were some changes required on the Ceph side, uh, such as and 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 in the and in NFS Ganesha, and so in 5.x and uh, Frank Frank is here uh, from the NFS Ganesha team, uh, so the, uh, he he worked on implementing the HA proxy proxy protocol. And what this would allow is for uh, for a, for the Ceph Ingress service uh, to actually pass the client the actual client IPs uh, to NFS Ganesha, and so that you could now enforce the client restrictions correctly uh, in your exports. Um, so that's the um, and and that that 
is uh, work that got completed uh, sometime uh, in this year. And so this 5.x version of uh, NFS Ganesha is not there yet. Uh, and I guess it, it, it has a release date uh, that I'm not very sure of. Maybe we should ask Frank. Um, Frank, is there, is there like a release timeline set for 5.x? Um, <clears throat> we haven't uh, set a specific uh, timeline, but the intention is very soon. Very um, soon, okay. Yeah, we're um, working through uh, fixing some bug reports, and then uh, once I get through that, I'll be closer to making a determination of when to tag 5.0. Awesome. Thank you. So. We have some pre-release uh, content that's available to us. I mean, this this stuff is uh, was uh, was included in a build that uh, was published, um, so so that we could do some of our testing. And um, the the intent is that five rod X will be the default that uh, the uh, reef release of Ceph uh, would would end up using. So if you were using Ceph Adam with uh, with uh, Ceph Reef, which is an upcoming release too, uh, and I, I suppose we'll we'll start seeing that show up in about a month. Um, you would you would see your Ceph NFS clusters be created with uh, NFS five, NFS Ganesha five. Um, so yeah, so um, what we are trying to do though is trying to test it with Ceph Quincy, um, but then there are there there, there is a Ceph side fix that is required as well. Uh, so that's that there's a Ceph tracker on line 15, uh, which tracks the effort to, to enable the uh, HA proxy prox protocol on the Ceph ingress service and also configure NFS Ganesha to use the HA proxy, um, uh, you know, that's set up by NF NFS, sorry, uh, Ceph ingress. So uh, there's work going on in this and we're, uh, we're, we're currently testing uh, you know how that uh, plays out, but eventually, uh, and hopefully, with the Bobcat release, uh, we 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 iron out any of these bugs. And our intention is to try to backport anything to the Antelope release uh, if we find any bugs in the in the Manila driver that don't work with these uh, you know ish, uh, these new developments in the uh, CFFS and in um, and in NFS Ganesha. So. Um, yeah, so you could, if you wanted to try it, uh, you could try the existing NFS Ganesha driver, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, the existing CFFS uh, driver with an NFS cluster, uh, but be aware that the client restrictions are not going to work and you will need NFS Ganesha 5.x and also a Ceph ingress fix that's ongoing. Um, so for, for it to realistically work just the way uh, everything works right now, uh, you should probably uh, hope that you can get this working with Ceph Reef release. Um, any questions so far on the on that? All right. Um, if uh, if there are none, I did want to take a mo moment to uh, to thank uh, Victoria and Francesco. They did a bulk of the work that was uh, required uh, to, to to set this up with Manila to test this. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about testing at the very end uh, on the OpenStack get. Uh, but I mean, kudos to them uh, to, to have persisted with all of this stuff and for uh, working with the NFS Ganesha team and the Ceph uh, teams or Ceph Adam teams. Awesome. All right. Uh, all right. Let, we can move to the next thing. Uh, I mean, while we are looking at NFS Ganesha uh, v5 uh, with the HA proxy support, uh, we uh, we might also be, uh, I mean, interested in some other things that that the NFS Ganesha community has worked on for the between the four and the five releases, right? Um, and some some interesting things that they shared with us was. Uh, native support to for uh, Prometheus and Grafana. Uh, so there, uh, I mean, the commit message is uh, is really uh, cool at explaining this, uh, and I've linked it out of there. Uh, so you could 
now track a lot of the uh, counters from um, Ganesha through uh, your log, uh, logging and monitoring systems. Uh, and that's pretty. Uh, that's that's quite a lot of visibility. And and I I, I was hoping that you know folks that are using NFS Ganesha at scale with the with OpenStack will find this useful. Um, and we're excited to try that out with uh, with uh, you know the Red Hat OpenStack platform, for instance. And it, another um, major thing is I think. Um, I, and I don't understand this completely. I think this uh, th this has to do with metadata caching. Um, so this is, I, I was told that, uh, or rather I am reading on the uh, NFS Ganesha release notes that th there's a lot of updates to LRU and uh, memory, memory issues have been resolved with MD cache. Um, and, and I know uh, Frank, mentioned this uh, uh, quite a bit with us. So I, I mean, this should affect uh, the CFF cell as well as anything else you're using with uh, NFS Ganesha, uh, if I'm right. Um, and there's there's also um, improvements on the CFF cell non-blocking and async IO. Um, and uh, Frank, I saw a note that they said this this is this feature is dormant until there is CF side fixes. Um, uh, I didn't understand that entirely. Uh, is there something that uh, we're waiting on from Ceph specifically? Yeah, there's a uh, significant <clears throat> um, CephFS patch to actually implement uh, non-blocking I/O in in CephFS. I see. Okay. And is that work uh, scheduled for a particular release yet? So the, the patch set is done. Um, and I've had some review comments. And I still haven't gotten back to um, finishing addressing the review comments. And then then it will need to get merged and, and then filter into downstream releases. So awesome. I'm, I'm not I'm not sure what the timeline on on that is yet. <laughs> Thank you. I found I think the uh, issue tracker. Just gonna add it. That seems like the Ceph pull request. Yeah, there's a pull request for it. <laughs> Oh, actually, there is a new one now. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I can check on check on this. Um, and the last comment I see that uh, see there is that they were planning to target this post the reef branching. Interesting. All right. Um. All right, we can get back. And th thanks, Frank. Uh, so those are some of the changes from the NFS Ganesha that might be uh, useful in OpenStack development uh, in, in deployments. Uh, and we'll hear more about those soon. Um, and there are some more parts in the in the uh, in the driver that we were working on uh, parallelly. Uh, so we had a little bit of a blip over here. The the thing that we weren't able to figure out if we were if we could convince. Um, the, uh, you know, uh, if we could get the use, use case completely translated across, uh, which is that OpenStack Manila users are used to seeing, um, you know, one export location uh, instead of multiple, and and that they are able to, uh, you know, uh, have a, 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 a NFS Ganesha, uh, you know, abstract away some of the stuff like, you know, we we can't use a we can't expose a a port for instance a non standard port for uh, 
for uh, mounting shares and so on. So we were working through some of those uh, things, and part of that we we uh, we had this piece that that was unresolved, which is how do you upgrade from what you're currently using, which is the DBest based standalone Ganesha installation, uh, to this NFS cluster, uh, even if you. Um, uh, I mean, so uh, the idea was we would provide some way within the Manila driver to 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 reconcile things with the uh, with, with NFS, so you don't have to worry uh, about it. Uh, but there are some things that we cannot really uh, take care of. For instance, that uh, you know we 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 still don't know if we can um, you know non disruptively move clients over. Um, from the uh, the existing Ganesha server to the new Ganesha server, and so we, uh, that's part of our testing still. Um, and there is some code that's required in the driver. And uh, this week, I think we started working on that, uh, and we've posted some patches. I think Carlos has linked one at the uh, thing. Carlos, do you want to start with that, and I can link the other ones? Yeah. Uh, for well, this one is for uh, the part where we would add preferred export locations. Uh, because I mean, as Gotham as got just stated, there's a chance that when we move uh, things like the well, we'll have two uh, servers, uh, we, we, that's just that we'll have a true servers up and uh, we would need to represent the export locations for the both servers. And uh, in that case, we would need to ensure that all of the uh, exports with the new NFS cluster would be the preferred ones and that the, the old one uh, would be like the uh, not preferred because that server is supposed to be the commission in the, the commission in the future. So that's the whole idea of this change. Uh, it is trying to uh, identify uh, or trying to represent what are the uh, preferred uh, export locations when we are uh, adding the exports to the shares. So uh, here it's basically like uh, trying to add uh, a couple of uh, things to the export locations when we are representing them. So uh, for the case of the um, old uh, Ganesha helper, where we would use deepers and so on, we will always state that this is the preferred false location because we are expecting people to uh, be moving away of that in the future because this is will also be uh, deprecated in the future. And for the NFS uh, cluster protocol or, or being when the user or the deployer has already configured the uh, NFS cluster IP, then uh, we would tag all of the export locations uh, that are coming from the uh, 7FS export IP uh, configuration that we have set as true. And if there are still Ganesh export IPs uh, configured in the cloud, then we would add them like as preferred false and return the export locations we have for those. Uh, but there are some uh, caveats with that. And a couple of things to, to keep in mind that I, I kind of trying to note here. Uh, first one being that if there is no CFFS Ganesha server configured, we use to use the uh, host name uh, as one part of the export location. So uh, with like this new approach, we aren't getting the host name and only we would represent that export if it, it has like an IP tied and it's configured on the uh, Ceph, uh, on the Ganesha export IPs. Um, and in case like the new one does not exist, like in case it does, it's not related to an IP, then it we wouldn't just like add the, that export location and uh, we would only display the export location for the new Ceph uh, server, for the new uh, Ganesha server. Uh, that's one of the things. It it does not sound to be like the worst thing in the world um, for a couple of reasons. Like if the, the export location is not preferred and new people are trying are willing to mount the share, uh, it, it's okay to just go ahead and mount it from the new location, which is, is supposed to be already better. So that's one of the things that we decided for that. Uh, and we, uh, of course, like there, there can be some more discussion and some more uh, other uh points to, to add on that. But that's basically some of the things we talked about. And one other thing is that identifying if the share is exported in both uh, uh, 
the old server and the new server could be a challenge, uh, meaning that, for example, let's suppose we have like a list of 100 shares already created and exported and uh, the new server is deployed and the like 100 shares would kind of coexist, like they would be exported in the both servers. And for that case, it's okay. Like I could just mount the shares using like the both export locations, it, it would work just fine. But as soon as we start creating new shares, then uh, it, it could possibly be uh, an issue because there is no way to identify for us, uh, like in, in a restart, for example, if the share is actually created uh, in the both export look in the both export IPs. So uh, that would be the complicated scenario because um, in that case, we would end up creating like the two export locations anyway, and the preferred false wouldn't even exist if a share was created after the migration happened. And uh, if someone tries to you to mount the share using the preferred the, the non preferred export location, then it would just fail. Uh, but we can try to work that around and uh, try to. Uh, at like uh, approaches. And one of the things that we will need to do for this and that we actually expect that will happen is that as soon as people have like everything migrated, they would try to move away to the uh, to the new server as soon as possible to avoid these kinds of things. And then the old exports would be like removed from the list of exports. So that's the, the things that we uh, have been thinking about and the things that we may need to make clear to the users when like this migration happens. So yeah, uh, that's that's a brief summary about this uh, setting uh, preferred export locations to like, uh, true or false and trying to represent uh, where should people be mounting the shares, like which export locations people should be mounting the shares on. So that's uh, basically the uh, the approach we've been trying to, to, to use. And it, it has a couple of things that, uh, I mean, uh, uh, that could uh, lead like to someone trying to mount a share, as I said, and failing. But I think that's not supposed to be uh, like one very bad thing because uh, if you uh, hit that and if you already are moving away from, from this thing, we are strongly recommending that you start using the new server anyways. Yeah, I mean, so there are some challenges in identifying whether we can um, support, I mean, so I think let's peel back. Uh, the, the intention is to not support the standalone Ganesha while you also have a NFS cluster uh, configured, right? That, that, uh, the, with that as the thing, the, this representing the export paths that, that used to exist is, is probably what uh, is like a uh, solution that would get you through a um, you know an extended transition period, uh, but it's not supposed to be working like this forever. Um, so at some point, if, if if all of your clients have migrated over to the to using the NFS uh, cluster that you've set up, um, you should be able to you know make some configuration changes, restart your Ganesha, restart your um, OpenStack Manila share process, uh, share manager process, and actually stop seeing these export paths. Uh, that corresponded to the older NFS Ganesha uh, instance. And um, in the meanwhile, while that is happening, all of these limitations exist, uh, such as, uh, I mean, seeing paths that may not work for you. Uh, but it, it, I mean, while it's not, uh, I mean, it may not be hard for us to implement something that will go check whether that uh, export path will actually work uh, uh, but we are just trying choosing not to do that because it it starts getting complicated and and also starts impacting performance on the uh, on share creation and 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 adding and deleting access rules um, because we will have to now talk to both the NFS cluster as well as the an existing NFS uh, uh, server that you you would have configured uh, to use with Manila. And so I think the bottom line is that since we will not take that um, performance hit and and uh, and since we will not con continue communicating with the NFS uh, standalone NFS server while you have the NFS cluster, um, you are just going to see these exports. And I think yeah, the, the, it'll it'll be about communicating to uh, users in the cloud saying that 
the preferred path should be used for any new mounts. Are there any concerns with this approach? Hopefully not. I, th I do think eventually when this shows up, it is going to lead to confusions if we don't really uh, clarify from the get-go what the limitations are. And yeah, that that's going to be a, an important part of, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, in terms of the documentation and perhaps, um, yeah, wherever else we want to communicate about this. Um, Let's roll on to the the other part, which is, um, I mean, how will we ensure that those um, access rules and exports are set up the right way with the new NFS cluster that you have um, automatically? Uh, that is a, a change we're trying to break out into two parts. One is, um, a, a, and this is something that might benefit all all uh, drivers. So uh, if we, if we're trying to change Manila uh, Manila's ensure share mechanism. Uh, to uh, to let the driver opt in for uh, reapplying access rules. So if the driver tells us that there is some configuration that that has changed and and that uh, the access rules need to be pre played back to it, the the Manila share manager is is capable of doing that um, the, after the, uh, performing an ensure shares operation. Um, so that's what this this change is all about. It 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 isn't too uh, too big. It it's quite simple. Uh, of course, there are no tests and stuff because I'm I, I'm actually actively testing this. Um, but what, what um, but the intent here is that if the driver um, you know uh, finishes updating its uh, all of its shares in this ensure shares loop and it it tags certain instances saying um, that it they, these these instances need. A refresh of its access rules. Uh, we'll just loop back around and provide the access rules uh, as an update to the driver, um, and then it it can just go from there, right? Like te technically, we're just transitioning those rules out from an active state to a queue to apply and and pushing it back to the driver. Uh, so that's one um, aspect of this change. The other aspect is the Ceph FS side. Uh, so as We've mentioned at the very beginning, the uh, uh, you know we try to uh, optimize on ensuring uh, shares. So this uh, this change is actually going to uh, commit that to all of the CFFS driver modes, native CFFS, NFS, and this this new NFS pro, uh, cluster protocol um, way as well. And what this will do is you have a, 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 when when the drivers start up, they look at their configuration, and uh, they'll determine if if the shares need to be ensured. Uh, and by that, it, uh, it would mean you know there's something that changed with the export paths uh, that we're detecting from the backend, or we realize that you're moving from the uh, old uh, CFFS sorry, the, uh, the standalone Ganesha to this NFS cluster. And that's again, configuration. So uh, we're looking at the config file and and determining whether we should, uh, you know, call back to the share manager service and ask for uh, uh, rules to be reapplied. Um, and, and this process should, should be slow only when those configuration uh, options change. Um, as in, this process should kick in only when config options change, but uh, otherwise you're not going to see ensure shares on every um, restart of the share manager service. So if you wanted to restart it yourself and, and kick this process back again, um, th there is a new config option. Uh, it's called uh, CFFS ensure all share salt. Uh, you could just ma manipulate that, it's a string. Um, and you could you, you could kick in, kick off the driver to re, re ensure the rules. Um, so yeah, so th this is how those changes would look uh, and would would pl play these access rules back to the um, to the driver. And in our case, when up, uh, this would help solve the 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 the, the 
upgrade scenario where you have a brand new NFS cluster that knows nothing about Manila shares. Uh, and you ha you just have to configure that NFS cluster in your uh, Manila configuration uh, and and just kick off this um, uh, the share manager and we'll take care of uh, you know creating those exports on the on the side with the same interfaces that we did in the driver. Awesome. Uh, so together we're trying to, uh, with these two changes, uh, trying to address the upgrade piece, but this is where we might need some feedback. Uh, so if you're using NFS uh, right now, uh, CephFS NFS right now, um, you know, take a look at these changes and these approaches. And if you think we're missing some uh, something, uh, please flag, us, flag it, because uh, this is still a work in progress, but we, we hope to get this uh, in, in the Bobcat cycle. Uh, but the intent is, uh, if if this is backportable, this isn't a brand new feature uh, in any way. This is basically trying to uh, get the NFS cluster that we introduced in the Antelope service uh, Antelope cycle to actually work. Um, so, uh, I mean, we are not in, uh, introducing any new RPCs or new driver methods. Um, re just refactoring. Um, so. If if we if you if we find that this is working as expected, we might pursue a backport uh, to the antelope cycle. Awesome. Um, any questions, concerns so far? Easy crowd today, thanks. Uh, so the last last bit that I did want to cover was the state of the CI. Um, it's it's our favorite thing to talk about, it, it, uh, which is, I, I mean, I, like anything with OpenStack Gate, it's pretty complicated, uh, and you throw Ceph in the picture, it's it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, so we've had several issues in the past cycle. One of them was, uh, I mean, we discovered thanks to the infra team. Uh, that we were trying to set up the Ceph cluster uh, on, um, I mean, we, we always set up the Ceph cluster on, on the root disk. And um, and there are some times that we just overwhelm the test node uh, by, by writing too much data. Uh, and, and, and these test nodes, if they're coming from uh, Rackspace, uh, they, uh, they actually have a pretty small root disk. And, and so the roots filling up and we're just you know ending up killing uh, killing the job and because zul thinks that uh, you know it wasn't able to uh, perform its own actions which is copying the logs uh, uh, out after after a successful or a failed run it it it, it just tries to re, re, uh, retry this job uh, each time and this retry loop is what alerted the infra folks because we had manila uh, gate stuck for like you know 12 to 15 hours uh, during feature freeze, and that was not good um, because we were rating on three different three retries of the NFS, uh, CFFS NFS job. Um, so we worked around it a little bit by reducing the number of uh, scenario tests that we run. So re reducing the amount of data that we write uh, in the tests themselves, and we we identified some somewhat duplicate tests um, where we were testing. Like API behavior, but doing the same thing twice uh, based on the NF uh, the, the IP protocol or something. Um, so, but this problem has not gone away. Uh, Rackspace uh, has an issue with uh, providing more uh, uh, root disk space, and I think I mean our experiments to try to place the Ceph data disk elsewhere outside of the root file system, uh, you know, just just failed because Ceph is not very tolerant with uh, you know sl uh, slow uh, externally attached storage um, that is non-local uh, and and that's what Rackspace actually provides which is uh, it it provides these volumes that are coming from an external source um, that that we get to mount as the data directory for uh, dev stack um, so we still don't have a, a, a an ideal solution there um, but if you have any ideas, please feel free to uh, to tell us, and we'll try them out. Um, and 
there is some issues with stable ci I'll skip us that uh, for uh, for now to 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 cover the Seth adam piece um, as you know we 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 did the whole Seth adam uh, uh, version of the dev stack plugin Seth in the z cycle um, and we were trying to get the get the jobs to get stable through the antelope cycle and why is Ceph Adam important? Because uh, the the existing package based deployment uh, that we do in the uh, in the non Ceph Adam job is not meant to stay forever. This is not something that the Ceph community supports uh, as a, as a way to set up your Ceph cluster uh, and and stuff. So we wanted to stick close to what the Ceph community uh, you know does in terms of cluster bootstrapping and stuff. And so that's Ceph Adam, uh, and and so and it and it's also meant to modernize some things and give you some uh, some new functionality that you don't have to bend over backwards to configure with the package based deployment. Uh, it makes things easier to set up. But uh, the downside here is that Ceph Adam is very resource in intensive, and uh, you're you're and and we were already running through the limits of everything uh, with putting an all in one OpenStack and an all in one. Uh, Ceph cluster on the same node. Uh, and so you will see that most of the Ceph Adam jobs started timing out um, and, and the timeouts were based off of, okay, we ran out of disk or we ran out of memory uh, and, and random things started failing. So we started retrying and the retries just ended up, uh, you know, uh, running longer than the timeouts that were afforded for, for the job. Uh, and so we last cycle, I think when we were at the PTG, we thought one of the things we can do is to split out this job into multiple nodes and and run uh, and and see if we can isolate the Ceph cluster on its own node um, and and have dev stack uh, processes and and you know uh, all the compute takes take place in in a different node if uh, or or different strategies around that, but uh, try to give it more resources than it than it currently has with a single node installation. Um, and we, we, I don't think we have, we've like, you know, we, we, we haven't completed that work that's still ongoing. Um, Ashley is pursuing that right now and she's testing uh, the standalone uh, stuff and, you know, comparing that and trying to get Manila multi-node to work for instance, uh, because we've so far not, uh, not had a multi-node job at Manila. Uh, so there might be some things that need to change even in the dev stack plugin that Manila has, we might have made some assumptions uh, that it's always going to be single node. Um, so that's the uh, thing. Uh, Ashley, anything to add there? Hey, no, not currently. Um, it's still a work in progress. A little slow this week because of PTG, but I'm still working on it. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. But this is the direction we're trying to take uh, so that we can you know, have a stable Ceph Adam job and then eventually uh, start removing the um, the, the package-based Ceph installation that we're doing with DevStack plugin Ceph and get rid of uh, those jobs. And this extends beyond Manila. We have, uh, you know, we have a similar uh, understanding with the, the Cinder folks, the uh, Glanz and Nova folks as well, they do know that the package-based installation is not going to live around forever. Uh, we we limp from cycle to cycle by patching, you know, where those packages come from. We currently have a major issue that the Ceph community is not building, um, uh, you know, packages for Jammy, for instance. Uh, and it's not it's not that they're not intending to build; they just don't have the 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 bandwidth to do that. Um, and and we we understand that pretty much because it 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 is uh, a labor intensive uh, thing and and the people that uh, had uh, Debian knowledge in the Ceph community are are diminishing. Um, so um, uh, we did try, I think, at some point to try to uh, use the distro builds for um, from Jammy, but I, I I think we didn't we didn't actually complete that work. Um, and I, I mean. So far, we've not been prioritizing that in this team to try to use the distro builds and to, to, to get package-based installation to continue to work, um, partially because we wanted to put our efforts in uh, in, in getting the Ceph Adam job, which seems more long-term, um, it, it, which may, seems more helpful long-term for us. Um, and, we, and we're getting the, this kind of testing outside of DevStack as well through the other places, uh, whether, whether that's... Uh, Triple O or um, you know Cola or 
OpenStack, Ansible, etc. Um, hey, got it. Yeah. Quick hey, question. Yep. Uh, do you have any standalone job passing with CFDM? Uh, yes. I, I'm not sure because so uh, yeah. there is an option which is supposed to save resources, uh, which means that you deploy the Ceph cluster with Ceph ADM after it's the cluster is deployed and everything is in place, it, um, Ceph ADM is disabled, which is supposed to reconduct the Ceph cluster, uh, you know, pretty much as a package-based installation. Uh, I'm not sure if this parameter makes any difference today, but it's something we may want to check with the orchestrator team to see if there is any optimization that we can take in particular scenarios to save resources. Okay. So just wondering if there is any job passing with CFADM to make a comparison. Uh, yes, and there is, and uh, there isn't also, like I guess we, uh, it, it it passes sometimes and then fails some others. So the, the uh, Manila side jobs, for instance, that's the link on the on the chat. I should add it back to the Etherpad. Haven't merged yet. And uh, the last attempt over there, uh, I think, from Victoria was to try to set that option that you're uh, mentioning. I think she called it Ceph Adam save, save, save resources on the dev stack side. And in the in dev stack plugin Ceph that does turn off Ceph Adam after the deployment. Interesting. I was trying to find that code. Yeah, it was just there. I, I saw that option. Oh, okay. Uh, I think we renamed that option. So that job needs to actually change its definition. It's now called disable Ceph Adam post deploy. Yeah, but that's a good suggestion. I, I wasn't thinking about that. Thank you. Yeah, and I think, I, I, I mean, the reason I say this, uh, it passed sometimes and not is because native CFFS, we didn't have, we didn't see, see those resource issues. Um, at, uh, at least not as much as uh, NFS. So I think we should probably break down this effort, try to get the native CFFS job. If it if it does continue to you know uh, be stable, we could we could actually promote that job as a separate thing, and uh, and then continue to investigate the NFS part. And that might be the one that um, you know we we pursue the multi node stuff for. Also, I, I remember we reduced the Tempest concurrency to one, yeah. uh, which proved that this uh, problem basically related to the resources. Right. Yep. Okay, I can take that AI to uh, you know refresh that patch and to split those jobs out. Try try the uh, native one, and and see how stable that is. Um, on the uh, integrated gate, I I have I don't have any updates, and I think I need to talk to somebody in the QA team and in the Cinder teams to see if they are making any progress in terms of um, you know testing with it. Um, it is. It, it, it you know CI it doesn't get as much love as as it deserves or it needs, uh, so it's going to be a slow effort. But we'll try to f hash that out. Um, I do know that I at least have been asked multiple times on different uh, 
places here that if if the Ceph community is going to end up building the Jammy images and if we can if we can continue doing the package based installation, um, and the answer so far is no. And it's it's a no not because they don't want to do it. It's a no because they don't have the resources right now. I wonder if it will change with new Ceph release because basically right now Ubuntu in the UC kind of well in default repos kind of provide the same Ceph version at least major one. So yeah. there is no urgent need in that uh, at the moment. And that's why like Ceph community is so uh, reluctant to build in uh, the packages at the moment. Right. Yeah, I'm hoping. Yeah, uh, with Reef, it might it might actually uh, be easier, or maybe it's something that they will prioritize. Um, the the one reason we weren't using distro packages in the past was because it was uh, it, it was pretty slow when we had a bug uh, that required to be you know uh, in the in the in on the Ceph site whether it was in the client or in the uh, in the server we'd we'd actually have to wait a long time so we start, we tried to stick around to what the Ceph community was shipping because at least we were able to use that the same tracker that we would create for the bug um but yeah yeah to but uh... Any idea if in Ceph IDM we are using Quay or, or, or we are trying to use uh, Docker Hub or there? Because, I mean, uh, I, I spotted that there is no latest version of Ceph available on uh, Docker Hub, for example, for Ceph IDM. So basically, like latest only uploaded to Quay or. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Francesco might know better. Uh... Do you know, Francisco, if they, they, they're planning to upload to uh, Docker Hub? I don't think so. Okay. Maybe Quai, the Quai IO space. Yeah, agreed. And that's where our Ceph Adam uh, code is pulling it from for CI. Oh, okay. Yeah, because by default it's, it's still Docker Hub. I, I believe at least for I don't know, maybe total releases of Ceph, not latest one. But yeah, something like sixteen. Or yeah, the, the problem that we had in the past was the rate limit for Docker. That's the reason why we moved to Quai, and and Ceph yeah. Ceph organization did the same. Okay. Yep. Great. Um, so with those as our AIs, anything else? Uh, any other questions, concerns? If not, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for uh, letting me, you know, uh, go on about the, all of the things about CephFS. Uh, we're excited uh, uh, to to wrap up this work to finish testing with the NFS clusters, uh, which is going to be a major improvement in terms of the way uh, you know users can scale their deployments uh, and stuff. So look forward look forward to discussing this a little bit more in the uh, at the Open Open Intra Summit as well, where we're planning to have a forum session uh, on on this topic. Um, with, with perhaps uh, any other operators in the room as well. Um, and hopefully by then we might have some test results as well. Awesome. Um, that's all I had. Thank you everyone uh, that participated uh, and you know, see you all elsewhere. Thanks. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Gautam. Thank you for joining us folks, Francesco, B3, uh, Frank. Uh, it, it's great to have you here in this room. Uh, thanks for the very detailed update, uh, Gotham. Uh, I think we can have a break now. Like uh, we can make it like around like a seven minutes break, and then we can get back to the next discussions. Uh, we have one more hour of discussions before our, our um, operator uh, hour. So yeah, uh, I think we'll be back in now six minutes. Then I'll pause recording.
Right. Uh, welcome back. So uh, let's continue with our, with our agenda. Uh, the next topic we have for today is the SQL Alchemy 2.0 uh, and other DB, DB challenges and changes. Um, yep, Gotham, would you like to get started? Hey, yes. Um, so yeah, this is uh, about a little bit about tech debt. Um, and so we can walk through different issues here. I don't know if uh, Maurice is here because I did have a question on the, um, can we get our EPR on our models uh, aspect, but let's get started. Uh, I think w w the first topic that we have is um, the issue with DB migrations. And uh, we, 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 very often end up failing um, the, uh, what is that? Uh, we, we, we often end up failing the test walk, wor walk wor uh, versions test that we have, which basically does a snake walk over all of the upgrade and the downgrade steps that we have. And, and we don't, we haven't had a great solution to this uh, so far. Um, I mean, partially because, I mean, it is a snake walk and it's designed so such that uh, in, in a way that we do an upgrade, we do some tests with uh, with the data we, and then we upgrade to the next version, do some the same tests with the same, uh, with, with some more data, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, proceed version by version. And before we upgrade to the next version, we are also testing the downgrade that was associated with that version. So the snake walk actually uh, is nested. Uh, and so it it ends up taking quite a lot of time to go through uh, you know uh, all the migrations that we had uh, that we have and I actually have lost count of how many we've we have so far but I suppose it's it's now at about about twenty or thirty and it, I mean at some point you you could even ask if we are doing the right thing here in terms of uh, you know wh uh, are we really going to gain anything by testing the upgrades and downgrades through all of these different uh, DB migrations, um, that's that's the that 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 I, that's a fair ask, uh, and and I don't know the answer to that. It is it is that we have just not taken a, taken a stance, um, and partially because, uh, and we've been one of those uh, teams that have consistently maintained the whole downgrade support uh, as well uh, even if uh, i mean nobody is having to use this in production uh, with any other openstack service for instance um and so that that, that that's i think one of the um uh, you know things we have to resolve for ourselves uh, and i think uh, felipe got started uh, last cycle on a uh, on on rewriting that test and seeing if we can gain some, uh, you know, um, time back uh, rather than spending all, all all that time on the snake walk. Uh, I know Felipe. I, I know where we we left that effort. Uh, always, Felipe on the call. I don't think so. Okay, no problem. I think he's in the Cinder Room. Uh, but yeah, I, I I can link the patch um, that we were pursuing and I think it just suffered, you know, the wrath of having too many things to do in this cycle that we just didn't pay attention to that. But we did end up bumping the timeout again. We hate doing that uh, <laughs> from release to release. But as we keep piling these database migrations on, uh, unless we fix something with either the test or the migrations themselves, uh, this is going to continue to be a problem. So that's the that's the first part of the tech debt. So if you have any bright uh, ideas on how we can handle this, uh, we did uh, we did have two approaches. One is to stop testing downgrades um, uh, because just because we support them uh, in the code does not mean that we actually. Uh, I mean, we've not really documented that we um, that you know we can support downgrades, for instance, and they're not supported el elsewhere in any of the op other OpenStack services. A lot of the OpenStack services have actually removed their downgrade code as well. So if we stop testing downgrades, uh, I, I, I mean, we would shave off quite a lot of the time that the uh, that that walk versions test takes to run through the database migrations. 
um and and also there is there's there's an aspect saying if you have a schema only migration um what, what we are doing with the tests is really we're testing for the data integrity um and so if you have a version that's just pumping schema uh, that is it's introducing a new field there is no real data transformation that's happening no data addition deletion whatever uh the, it, we can we can stop doing um the uh, the data checks in each of those things so what we're currently doing is we're we're executing all the data checks for all of the versions uh, prior to that particular db version that we are uh, that we have just upgraded to and so that's that's kind of wasteful because if you ha just have a schema change, let's say you introduced a new column uh, in the shares table, uh, and that the new column comes with a default, we are not just testing that that new column has uh, has been populated with that data. We are also doing all the previous data checks that that were defined. Um, so that's that's just a, a function of that uh, of the way we do that, and I feel like. That, that, that was another thing that I think uh, the Neutron team identified and said, we'll, we'll take out um, the data checks where they're not required uh, or they're redundant. That's one way, one more way we should be pursuing, I think. Um, and it makes sense because uh, you're it's repetitive at that point. Uh, I think the part, the part is to identify whether you're doing a data insertion or uh, or, uh, or just a schema change. Um, so that's the uh, that's the second approach we can take. And the third thing that seems to be popular elsewhere is that we end up uh, squashing DB migrations and deleting some some old ones. Um, and the and the reasoning here is that you have ancient and archaic versions of OpenStack uh, that we are maintaining DB migrations for. Uh, so. The, the approach that teams have taken is they've taken like a cutoff version, let's say Okata or something like that. And everything that was before that ends up becoming one database um, migration. And so you you end up like uh, removing all of those Alembic uh, migration files and you, you, you set a different base to start your up migrations from. Uh, and and that will of course save time and, and and energy in the in the git because you just have one instead of twenty that were probably happening uh, until that cycle. Um, so uh, certainly uh, useful and and it'll it'll make us ne less nervous if we picked a, a release that's old enough that nobody is using uh, theoretically, right? Uh, and. And I, I do want to go beyond the support cycles of OpenStack itself upstream because it is possible that some somebody might end up trying to upgrade from whatever version that they have, uh, even if it's not supported by upstream OpenStack, to a supported version from upstream OpenStack, and we don't want to break their upgrade. Um, so that's the, the that's the, uh, the the downside of that. So picking a version and then squashing the DB migrations would be. Uh, would be would be the challenging part. Um, so, but that's another approach. And what else? I think that was it in terms of a uh, fixing up that test that keeps annoying us on the gate. Um, but is the test doing the right thing? Um, that is is totally up to debate. I think yes, because we've got quite a, quite a few issues with data transformations with these migration data checks. Uh, in the past, but those issues get resolved in the in the code, right? Once the code is done, it's reviewed. It's it's in. Um, uh, we we rarely ever take a look back at these migrations, uh, and we never make a change to a uh, to a database migration um, after. Uh, it, it, it it makes no sense. You can't change a migration that's already shipped. Uh, so we end up introducing a new migration if any if any changes are required. Um, but yeah, uh, those are some of those things that uh, we were thinking. But I, I guess the, the the ask here is if you're familiar with this or if you're interested to just you know go investigate this, uh, it, it, you'll have the eternal thanks of the community for uh, you know fixing a major uh, gate issue. Um, and you would, if you've been working on Manila, if you've been putting patches up, you know that this test fails. 
uh, and and I say often, but I can probably pull up stats from the from Zool. It's it's not it's not rare uh, for sure. And uh, maybe it is it's worth qualifying what kind of test nodes uh, this ends up failing in. Uh, typically, we've just tag tagged them as slow nodes. Right. It, it takes a long time for you to figure out the, the snake walk on our uh, migrations because it seems to work in some nodes, whereas it just fails uh, some others. Maybe we'll, we'll end up realizing that, uh, you know, Rackspace has some really slow nodes. I don't know why we're picking on Rackspace today, but whatever. Like, you know, uh, uh, just a way to thank them for uh, donating their resources to, to Zool. But that's the, uh, that's the intent here. Um, so if if anybody is interested, please uh, you know pick up this work. And if you if you if you would like to chat, I'm I'm happy to you know talk you through the thing that we've done so far. Uh, if nothing, I think we just need to take an AI uh, to pursue one of these as a community um, by the end of the cycle, so that we can have a same migration going from uh, Bobcat to C. And it can't be the band-aid that we add every other release. Uh, thanks, Carlos. Yeah, so I uh, thanks. With... Yeah. I think Philip is on the call now. Uh, oh, is he? Okay. Right. Yeah. Hey, Felipe. Uh, sorry hey. to put you on the spot, but just wanted to find out if if there was if uh, you had any findings with that patch that you wanted to bring up. Sorry, which patch? Got uh, the one that Carlos is just pulling oh, up. Okay. This is the... That's... Uh... That's this is a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah, it's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it was, I remember that I run this like three, three or four months ago. Uh, if I remember, we I think you mentioned that we could use the neutron, the neutron solution for this problem, but from my memory, it's not the same. It's and I think it based I don't remember where it based some notes regarding this. Uh, it seems that you you should, uh, there is a snake process of down, downgrade and, and upgrade. And I think this can be, this is different from, from Neutron. If I remember correctly, they don't I do I think this. I found your notes here. I remember we added it to Launchpad, the Launchpad book. And I think you, I remember we discussing this in a model mini. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah October of last year. Yeah, more than four months ago, and yeah, let let me read. Yeah, I have posted one patch that tries to fix this, and I don't know how often it's, it, it it occurs on. In, in, in community CI, but on down, in up downstream CI, it's very often. We, we, I've seen. Oh, it. I see. So okay. I, I'd like to fix this to have our our uh, unit test running. You know, where we have our our job that runs uh, check jobs downstream in, in for Manila at least in our downstream CI. It's not passing a long time because of this test walk version. But I think we can try to, to see an approach for fixing this. But we have a good, uh, a good case that we can easily see if it's working or not. It's the NetApp CI downstream because it, it happens okay. all time, all time there. OK, awesome. OK, no, th th thank you. That I didn't know that. and. So that's a consistent place, at least to test that test theories. Um, so yeah, I mean, you asked if we can uh, ignore the reverse walk. I think we discussed that just before uh, you joined. That that is one of a uh, uh, that is a, probably a good approach, uh, where we can drop down, um, you know, the um, downgrades during these upgrades, 
So as we are snaking through, we're just keeping on, uh, we're, we're doing the downgrades with every upgrade. Uh, we can st avoid doing that and that will give, shave off quite a lot of time because with every downgrade, the test repeats. Uh, so we can try we can try that. And the other thing that we discussed was squashing the DB, DB migrations. So I'm happy to chat with you if you if you're planning to pursue this. And we can try a few things. Yeah, I'm happy to fix this one. And also, I think there is a possibility of running. Uh, if I remember, we can run in a separated thread, stuff like that. Uh, it's a neutron, I think, an idea too. I don't know if it's neutron. I, I think so. They they chanted. Uh, I think they they like. I think they use a specific thread, a specific execution for running the test walk versions or the the, the, mice, the, the DB test, the DB tests. Oh, I see. Job. Okay. Yeah. So basically, you let you let the other unit tests finish up, and then you do this test as a separate thing. Yeah, I, okay. I remember something that direction, but I I don't remember if I test this. Uh, Okay, I, I I can't remember, <laughs> but yeah, I think this is an option. Yeah, that's worth it. I think we were considering something like that for the secure R back tests uh, because we, they cannot run alongside other tests where you're modifying the global policy object. So it's something similar in this case where you might end up, uh, you know, starving a thread uh, because you're taking too much too many resources. Um, and so we we would just let the other uh, tests finish. And then, uh, you know, run this single file. Yeah, this seems fine. Have you tested okay. with uh, with the this this job with what you mentioned? The uh, no, our... I I'm I'm just hearing of it, but it's worth trying it out. I think. Agreed. Okay. Nice. On the uh, RBAC stuff, no, I, uh, the, uh, that, that was another example that I, I think I might co-pursue something like that because uh, I had a similar problem where, you know, tests were interfering with each other. Um, but in this case, they're not interfering as much as uh, you're running out of resources. And so probably the thread becomes very, very slow. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks, Felipe. Uh, I, I guess we can take the AIs to, to, to follow up on this and probably bring it up in a future Manila meeting on, on the progress we make. Um, yeah, I think we can, can bring this back and try some, some ideas that we, we have here, like removing the snake, probably running a spirit thread. And I can try to to set up uh, a NetApp downstream CI to the upstream, you know, so you can trigger upstream the pipe, the, the check job, the downstream check job, so we can see this nice. failing. I think that's that's a good way of reproducing the bug. Easily. Yeah, that'll be helpful. Yeah. How you do that? Thanks. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, I think this could be a, a good approach, but also like the other approach Gautam was mentioning earlier was like trying to do only the uh, latest data check would be also good, I think, because I mean, uh, we, we wouldn't be like doing everything in the same job. And uh, yeah, I think it possibly would suffice. So if that's the case, and if that's uh, one approach we could take as well to try to like get rid of this issue, then I think, this could be one thing we could try as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll follow up, I guess, between Felipe and me. Uh, we'll try some things and, and see what, what uh, can work. I, I do think, the, the, I mean, we can gain value by squashing the DB migrations too. Um, and, and it's time, I think, because we have yeah. rolled over the alphabet. There is quite a lot of history there that, um, you know, I think we're, uh, we're ending up testing unnecessarily. Yeah. Um, we don't have to be too aggressive, but I think we can shave some, uh, you know, effort off. Sure. Agree. 
Awesome. Uh, do you guys, uh, do you think it'll be helpful to add uh, this information to the lunch pad bug? Um, just that it was discussed in PTG and, uh, and yeah. loop it back to the recording? Yes, that will be helpful. Thanks, Vida. Uh, we'll, we can do that. And uh, yep. And and I know if we forget, you're not going to forget. You're going to bring this up in the future Manila meeting. So thank you. <laughs> no, thank you for the discussion because I now I really understand the problem because we discussed it in detail. And I'm curious about this uh, schema versus data change, right? Like selectively exclude the changes that are only schema change. Uh, they don't really need to be snaked through. Uh, is, was that something you guys considered as well, uh, fi finally? Because uh, the two options didn't include that. I'm just curious. I, that's... Yeah, I don't think we, we've tried it, um, but it was something that was thrown around as an idea elsewhere. Um, and it kind of makes sense, right? Like technically, uh, since there is no data transformation, there's no data check that's required. Um, right. Uh, but it again is uh, is something we've got to do with with a little bit of honesty. Like in case of, I mean, you can uh, I mean, it would be something we can only enforce via code reviews or something like that. If you're maintaining a list of schemas that you want to do the data checks for, uh, sorry, the the migrations that you want to do the data checks for, we need to make sure that that list is properly compiled. Um, yeah, there's some accountability counting going on for that one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, checking. Thanks, guys. I will add the info after uh, the link is available. Thank you. All right. Uh, anything else about that uh, database snake walk issue? Nope, nothing on my side. All right, thank you. Uh, so let's move on. I think the next one was um, missing indexes. Um, and this uh, is again another uh, issue that actually I was listening to on, uh, on an internal mail thread that um, you know we had with, um, with regard to Cinder. And uh, Cinder started working on this stuff where there, there is a lot of, uh, th there are a lot of queries that we do a lot of times over and over and uh, again, but we've uh, we've not actually taken care to uh, to to augment the uh, tables with the proper indices. And so this might end up, uh, you know, um, this is ending up slowing down those uh, queries, right? And you're not expected to be running the, those queries if you, if you don't don't have uh, the indexes set up the right way. Uh, that, that's the f philosophy, I think. When when we introduced the uh, database model, we probably didn't picture that we would be performing a query at a different time. Um, and so, yeah, we, we didn't end up adding an index. Uh, and so the, I think Cinder went through the exercise recently of, of uh, you know, auditing their tables and adding, uh, you know, indexes wherever where they were, there was a foreign key relationship that they were often referring to when pulling up their uh, database tables, and um, and it, it 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 paid off. I think um, I was list, I was looking at some test results and stuff like that. So I I, I was hoping we can do something similar with the Manila tables and. And then do like a, a comparison of of some of the queries that uh, that we have, and I I feel like this will help with things such as uh, I mean uh, Maurice had a bug recently in his deployment where um, we were pulling up replicas in a timed thread in a in a periodic job, and um, and that and that job would would pull up every single replica that was there uh, and try to process that with the backend, but the 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 Query to pull up the replicas exceeded the periodic interval for that um, for, for the thread itself, and and he had I think in the order of a hundred a few hundreds if I'm right. Um, oh, he's not on the call, uh, so we can't check with him. But a few hundred uh, resources. But then if you're looking at replicas, we're not just looking at replicas. We're also inflating that with share data. 
and and with when you're looking at shared data you're probably also uh, conflating that with some other uh, stuff so we are chaining a bunch of resources when you're pulling it up from the database and and so if those chains are not optimized like they're not indexed you're going to perform a more um, you know intensive query on the database something that takes more time and so in, uh, in i mean worth checking if you're missing indexes is the is the goal here i think um, and I guess one of the things is we, 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 these indexes, I think we pursued that in the past and I did yeah, link it on line 104. Um, the deal with these uh, indexes when we start adding them is we have to do that with a database migration uh, and we have to pick a naming schema, right? And and we have one for SQL Alchemy, with, uh, but if we didn't, uh, and, and if somebody has already added some indexes in their environment, uh, we, we, you know, we should somehow, uh, you know, uh, so those deployments must have a way to work around this. You can, you can, you'll have to go around, I guess, and rename some things uh, directly on the database. Um, but yeah, we, I, I, I mean, it has to be something we do carefully and and document that we have done uh, in as part of the upgrade step so that. Uh, you know, if deployments already have made optimizations like this, uh, they can they can work around it. So I guess one thing I can do is, I, if you're missing a bug uh, or or an RFE or a blueprint of sorts, so we can create uh, create one. Yeah, that would be very helpful to track this. And uh, yeah, we can use this for organizing ourselves. Thanks. Yep. But I think it, this will uh, be useful and it will really help us as well. And yeah, we, we get the chance as well to take a look at what worked, what didn't uh, when looking around. So yeah. But thanks for looking into this and for bringing this up. No problem. You're welcome. I think. We we won't solve all of the issues with which uh, Maurice was hitting on his deployment with this, but I feel like uh, I mean we 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 can get a start on you know some obvious issues like you know uh, and and part of the problem also is that when we are coding these models at the time when these models are introduced we probably don't I mean these tables are introduced we probably don't think of it. Too much about the way we uh, we we layer the SQL Alchemy models on top of those tables, um, and and I, I see a pattern. Uh, and we were talking about it, Carlos. That uh, if you have two tables that you think are always going to be loaded together, you end up putting a join load uh, directly on the model. Uh, but then there might be queries where you don't want to do that, um, where you do, where you only care about a single resource and you don't really care about the information that's coming from the uh, other thing that's getting joined loaded with it uh, just by the def virtue of the default uh, and and i saw you know in the, in our models files there are like quite a lot of those tables and it, you you could quickly run into a situation where you're pulling up something completely unrelated right like let's say the user messages table and the user messages table decides to uh, also tie tie up with the uh, with the shares table which is which ties up with the export locations table the shares table also ties up with the access share instances and the share instances to the access rules and the access rules to some uh, access rules mapping and so on and you'll end up with every query uh, you know loading half of the database from manila and that's uh, yeah, that's that's definitely not the intent as you as you write this. So I guess we should actively discourage those default join loads that that happen in the uh, that are defined in the uh, models files as new tables are being added. Um, and and if we can go through and see, you know, we can replace those join loads with specific queries uh, if if we don't need the information all all the time. Uh, we can just introduce a query that uh, that loads that particular table at that exact time when we need it when we need it. Um, so that's a little bit of a bigger effort because it's like you know cleaning up work that that's already happened. And if if anyone's motivated to do that, that again is is going to be really helpful. But I don't know if we want to like you know create a bug and 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 you know call call that out so that we can 
you know track it yeah sure that that would be great yeah one one thing that came to my mind while we, we are discussing this topic is have we already uh, run in kind of profiling code with manila so we can catch some some parts of the code that's the is the problem you know it's yeah. the bottleneck you know because I agree that we we should improve this like index or looking to this lazy lazy load and something like that. It makes total sense. It will increase the code. But I think what we could do to get a, a better feedback would profiling the code running like tempest. You know, we can run the tempest and see what kind, what part of the code is taking more time. And also we could like compare like when you adding the index. Uh, for some like this code is taking longer. So how can we improve this part of the code to get to speed up? So I don't know if you already have done this before to see, but uh, I think that's that's a good thing that we, we should track or at least have a way for when this one, once uh, I release, you know, just to see how the code is going. If, if we are adding some code that's slowing down the, the Manila, so we need to track this to to avoid, like like Maurice report, but like Maurice report, you know. I don't know. Probably did. I'm totally sure that the index would definitely help us, but how much? That's the point. I want to see. Okay, that's we were running with like half second, and now it's running one second. Or it's running. I know a quarter of of time of second. Yeah, exactly. So, so you know, uh, that's that's one interesting thing, and it makes this very helpful for the operators. You know, that's running with high loaded environment. I agree, and so the, uh, I mean, the answer for that was supposed to be the rally test that we run, and we run it per commit, uh, and just that you know it's. Um, I mean, it, it requires us to look at it more seriously, I guess. We, we, we have to open up the rally results and see whether uh, this patch introduced a regression as opposed to the patch before it kind of a thing. Uh, it, it, there is no way to compare, I guess, with rally with, with or without this patch. That would have been useful because that would have been straightforward. Um, but so far i think the uh, at least the thing that you're asking whether do we run profiling tests we run it with rally we run it with probeat uh, outside of uh, the uh, manila git but at least with rally on the manila git trying to find you a job that kind of shows you what the and and because these just pass i think we just end up ignoring those but Here's a possible result on the. Uh... Oh, sorry. That's a bad example because we just don't have logs from there. <laughs> Let's see. Maybe a newer patch. What is the name of the job? Sorry. It's uh, Manila Rally No SS and Manila Rally SS, I think. And so you can just look at the build history. So let me link that instead. It runs with like dem 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 driver or yes, uh, it runs with the. I yeah, I think it runs with the dummy driver. That's part of the problem. Yeah, it's a dummy driver. Yeah, if it were with them dive at least on the GB later, there's no difference, you know. Yeah, if it runs. I think that the, the, the drivers 
doesn't the driver don't touch on the DB. So at least for retrieving and getting you know, dating data is the same. Exactly. Right? Yeah, that's the idea, I think. Um, but it's also been a while since we added any of these rally tests. You can actually see the tests are in tree. So it is possible that some of the, I mean, the queries that we're making are not really all meaningful. <clears throat> okay, is um is there any other question related to this? Uh, Besides the, the sync, um, oh, yeah. uh, um, are we out of time? Are oh, we, yeah, uh, we, we kind of are, yes. Uh, okay, yes, cool. but uh, no, no worries. I mean, uh, there's time for the other one. And I, I know we still need to cover the SQL, SQL me 2.0 thing, but we can do this as, that as part of tech that as well. I don't intend yeah. to take a lot of time on that. I see Morris on the call. And uh, do you have something else to add, Morris, or a question you have related to this? Thanks for joining us, by the way. I see you are muted, but I cannot hear you. I don't know if it's only me, but. No, I can't uh, hear him either. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Double mute. Um, yeah, I already put uh, uh, one uh, question on the Etherpad. Um, um, sometimes I find myself um, going to the uh, going to the Manila shell uh, interactively and and querying stuff. Um, um yeah and and whenever i list something out of the database i only see uh the abstract objects but not what the ids are for example or i i always have to have to use the uh, two dictionary method to to get to know what i what i actually have at hand right now and yeah that was just my question if we are bumping sql alchemy maybe we would get that or if you have I, to do something actively. i i think you should be able to get that and uh, and that was part of the base uh, model from sql alchemy if i if i remember right um it could be and yeah the question, question is also if others have, have interest in, in that yeah. So have you tried the to dict thing from from the, uh, from the model? Uh, yeah, to, to dict always shows me the right thing. Yeah, but it's yeah it's quite cumbersome when when I have a list of of things and yeah, you have to iterate through the list to go to dict everything. Yeah, yeah, that's each model, but. I suppose. So, uh, are you proposing something that, uh, you know, that we might have to, uh, that we could add to the uh, SQL Alchemy models that uh, will help your case? Yeah, I've seen there are some mix-ins, but not. I think not for OsloDB, but for for um, there are mix-ins we could use to just, just get the basic stuff like uh, the ID showing. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. And I see it in else, see it being used elsewhere. 
some sort of listification. Like I see oh, it yeah. in uh, Neutron, for instance. Yeah, the question would go in that in that direction if there is some yeah some knowledge in the community of, of other services that already have something like that that we could make reuse of. Uh, yeah. Thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good example. Yeah, but it, yeah, it would mean we would have to come up with things for, yeah, for each single, model. Yeah. yeah, every single thing. And and what makes sense, I think, because uh, in their case, they're trying to uh, you know concatenate the IPs. Uh, and yeah, I see a similar thing everywhere else saying, I mean, there are though base models that actually just for example, something like this. Let me copy another link. Uh, and yeah, that's. And, uh... Sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry. So, um, just um, uh, sort of the second use case. So the one one is uh, the interactive debugging. So when I when I'm on the uh, Python shell. And the other is uh, sometimes uh, error messages. So, um, for instance, when my um, purging of soft deleted entries is failing, it is failing with uh, couldn't delete, couldn't delete chair instance, and then this, um, yeah, I, I, I get no hint what the chair instance ID was because I only get the um, the model representation locked in the error, and that would that would help. Tremendously, yeah. Okay, I see. And and the purge fails, uh, but uh, is there another reason besides what failed? Uh, um, most of the times it's because of um, um, violated foreign keys. So it cannot it, it cannot delete the share instance because the metadata has already been deleted or, or something like that, or it has, has not been deleted. And, Mark this deleted or soft deleted or something like that. Okay. So and basically, those could be bugs, right? Like yeah. technically, that we're missing. Yeah, could be bugs, but also could be um, uh, because the service exits in the middle of a delete, um, and with oh. uh, the way we are running uh, with with uh, uh, running on Kubernetes um, pods, then. Yeah, we are very often shutting down the services hard, hardly and not gracefully. So yeah, yeah. So it could be bugs. Yeah, that there are there are that's um, not handled properly in a transaction or so. But it could also be things that we would simply have to accept. And no, uh, no, seriously. Uh, it, it, I mean, these are probably so, sort of the issues that. Uh, it, we should be in, more interested in because um, we we we, we kind of have the same issue. Uh, we're we're trying to uh, you know, as you're probably aware, the in the uh, I mean Red Hat's product is also pre pretty much going to be built on uh, on top of Kubernetes, uh, which is deploying Manila on top of Kubernetes, and it, we we were kind of uh, you know thinking of okay, what are all the things that could go wrong if you know, if we are trying to rely on uh, Kubernetes, you know, scale, scaling down, uh, and scaling up, scaling down, kind of thing, uh, and can we can we actually do a, gra a graceful service restart um, the next time we we do restart and stuff like that? Uh, so this is interesting. So in the middle of a of a deletion operation, it's possible you've left the database in an inconsistent state that you could uh, end up affecting a purge later on yeah <clears throat> that's okay. that's happening yeah and I've, uh, we've written uh, some uh, jobs that clean up 
those inconsistencies. So nice. So we are we are checking, yeah, where it wouldn't make sense if a, if uh, the parent has been deleted, then uh, it, it doesn't make sense to to keep a, a, a dangling child and just delete that too. Then. And do you think it's something that we can add directly into our purge script? Um, yeah, could be, yeah. Yeah, I think so, because I feel like our Perth script is is just, you know, uh, walking back through the database and, and finding all of the, uh, you know, re related stuff and trying to delete the, uh, the base model um, first and then, uh, you know, cascade the deletions. It's possible we can, uh, you know, add some try accepts and, and proceed with deletions over there based on some sort of condition. I'd like to, uh, yeah, if, if you have a link to that, to, to what you do, I, I'd like to take a look and see if we can, uh, you know, improve the purge script itself. If you're willing to share it, that is, I'm not sure if it's uh, open source. Yeah, it's, it's already open source. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, for sure, no no objections to adding the uh, REPR stuff um, if if it helps you know these sort of debugging cases, and um, it, I guess you know having it generically added to the base model might just be giving you the ID or something like that. Uh, and if that is helpful, that's great. And maybe we can go add specific uh, stuff to each model only if uh, necessary. Yeah, you can. You can overwrite then in the case that you need more. Yeah. Yep. Good. That, I think that would be a good addition for debugging and it should be harmless. So yeah, uh, I'm, I'm in for it too. Awesome. Thanks. I think we have a couple of AIs there. Sure. Awesome. Thanks for bringing this up, uh, Maurice. Uh, yeah, we can try to work on this during this uh, next cycle. Uh, yeah, the, the change, the changes, uh, we can base ourselves in the uh, other people that are doing this. But I think the uh, like having this in the base model, it should be, it should be indeed good. Right, is there something else uh, for this topic? Okay, so I think we can uh, leave SQLock me 2.0 and tag that for tomorrow. Uh, so we can keep on track for the operator hour today. So I can just like do some adjustments to the agenda later and then uh, we can cover this tomorrow. Yeah, that works. Thanks, Carlos. No problem. Awesome. Okay, so I think we can we can get uh, if there isn't something else to add to this topic, we can get a six minutes break before our operator hour. So yeah. Uh, let's get the six minutes break and get back in five minutes now. <laughs>